Okay, I see that we have been joined by a, a wonderful group. Um, today, I am delighted to be joined by Simone Cipriani, who is the founder and chief of the Ethical Fashion Institute. Um, and it's wonderful to see you, my friend. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, again, uh, usually lurking around the conduit in one of your trips to London, but I'm sorry that we are on other sides of an ocean. But um, what, what today I want to spend some time talking about is uh, the future of ethical and sustainable fashion. And in particular, uh, what COVID does to pretty significant changes that are already underway in the industry. Um, so I think one of the things that I want to do is particularly speak to you as a person who really has pioneered and done a lot of work in um, trying to promote ethical um, fashion and ethical fashion production in the global south, very significantly in Africa, but also elsewhere, and, and have a sort of potentially hard conversation about who wins and who loses um, as a result of COVID and, and how the, the quest for ethical fashion is either accelerated or set back. Um, so let, let's start with the broad components and perhaps between us we can list uh, you know, the changes that are underway in the industry that push us towards greater sustainability and what those are. Let's just go through those fast because I think a lot of conduit members will know those. And then let's track back and see how those will either be thwarted or enabled um, as we emerge from, from the COVID crisis. So give us in a nutshell where you think the main changes need to happen and what those are in the fashion industry in order to move us towards greater sustainability? That's worth saying. Well, I think there are many avenues and I'm focusing on what will come out of, of this COVID emergency. As you rightly say, this COVID emergency, this situation will accelerate some existing process. First of all, processes related to online trade online trade will dramatically accelerate and it's already accelerating because we are all shopping online for what we need and in fashion too but then there is something else which is uh, where production takes place uh, i think we will see some reshoring of production to to europe to the us to the regions where then fashion is sold uh, because consumers will start asking about uh, community engagement, about uh, reducing distances, reducing the carbon footprint and all the rest. This will be a bit of a problem for us because we produce in, in Africa, we produce in Afghanistan, we produce in war-torn countries that are in the periphery of the world of today. And the business model we had was to stay here, to enjoy some advantage in, not only in terms of costs uh, but also in terms of story of engagement of consumers and all the rest in order to to create a supply chain for some for some international brands and this means that some of our productions will be probably diverted away from these places towards europe towards the us towards china and so on i have friends in italy who I'm Italian by origin, I don't live in Italy, but I'm Italian, who, who are telling me they are organizing themselves to reshore productions and to make productions for the Italian and the European market, productions that used to take place elsewhere. So this is, this is something that, 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 that we will see. And then there is all the theme around material science. Uh, materials are becoming extremely important and even in organic, in bio, we see change. How do we treat these materials to keep their organic properties, but to be more performant? We are working a lot on cotton and on organic silk with a giant of, uh, of silk rat in Italy, a giant company that makes luxury fabric in order to have 
proper silk with good performance uh, properties, but still, still organic. And at the same way, how to recycle, to enable the recycling of all these things in a, in a, in, in a vision of circular, of circular economy. This is also another problem. But then there is a wider theme, maybe unbiased, <laughs> surely unbiased because of the job I do, but it's the wider theme of the contribution of the fashion supply chain to the capital of the world of today, to the social capital, to the environmental capital of the world of today. And this fashion supply chain has always given a bad or, or a good contribution to this capital because the fashion supply chain extends all over the global south and it impacts a lot in local societies in terms of social capital and on the global environment. On the global environment, we all know, will go towards more sustainable materials, more sustainable practices, circular economy, absolutely, we all know it. But in terms of social capital, uh, we have to be extremely careful because on one side, this post-COVID will bring back productions to places where, from where they went away, the global north. Surely something will come back. Uh, some, some other things will be strengthened in the core of the, of the factory of the world, China and Asia. But many, many productions may leave the places where they actually are, and they are in very weak states. This means that in these settings, the social uh, capital of these societies will be affected. Uh, unemployment, but not only that, uh, conflict in the places where we work. We work in conflict-torn countries. If, if we lose our productions, conflict, the incentive for conflict over scarce resources will be, will be enormous and then global terrorism and forced, or if you want, irregular migration. So we have to think also what will be the impact of this and be creative in remodeling the new supply chain of this industry, uh, coupling it with the tools of international intervention, development aid, uh, for instance. Uh, what is the future of these productions in the global south? Where are the weakest uh, nations where this production takes place? What are the consequences I listed before? How can we mitigate that? How can we minimize that? i give you an example. Now, there's a peace process in Afghanistan, which is, everybody knows what, what, what goes on, a tentative peace process. Uh, the very different factions and the Taliban, first of all, are not uh, respecting that. Violence is still widespread. But if this stop, at the same time in which the emerging new productions of this country that are already on the international market, food, saffron, dry fruits, and, uh, and, and some other things, including our silk, if all these productions get stopped, because of this global change in the post-COVID emergency, this country will collapse. The society of this country will collapse. And no peace process can take place in these conditions. This is an area of uh, instability which will affect the whole of Central Asia. The same applies to the Sahel. Uh, you sit in Europe. I remember the days in which you used to sit in New York. And I remember once I was in a long queue under the rain outside the Whitney Museum and you, and you came by and you took me in. You were my savior. But, but now, now you sit in Europe, which is highly affected by this phenomena, by forced and irregular migration from the Sahel. We work in the Sahel. The Sahel is a very fragile economy, especially in Western Africa and between Niger Mali, Burkina Faso, Benin. This economy, uh, which is a regional economy, is now affected by global terrorism, which uses uh, 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 migration and also uh, 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 criminal uh, activities to finance themselves. Now, if the regular, if the formal, the legal economy of these places uh, collapses, this terrorist state will be uh, strengthened. Now, ISIS has moved out of, of, of Syria as, as the new expansion place. They are still there. It's still present in between Syria and Iraq and so on. 
but the new territory of expansion of ISIS is in between Niger, uh, Chad, uh, uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, these are the places. They count on this collapse that will come for these peripheral economies in the post-COVID. And the fashion, fashion is part of that, because this area I'm talking about is a cotton production area. A lot of companies buy cotton in this area, a lot of companies produce fabric in these areas, and we had started also making uh, garments and other things, not only for local designers, but also for international brands. There's an economy based on fashion in the area there. This economy is likely to collapse because of the reorientation of consumption and production I was talking about before. This is an area of instability which will create a huge domino effect in the Mediterranean and in Europe. Uh, I think we who sit in Europe today and who work in the fashion industry, but also elsewhere in the world, we have to carefully think about what happens in the supply chain, also in these terms. Before it was difficult to have this conversation. Uh, when, I, when I had this conversation all over the world, people used to tell me, yeah, but we are in the fashion industry, it's the fashion supply chain, it's this, it's that, these are geopolitical considerations, it's another thing. But in the post-COVID, geopolitics and economy will be closer than ever. And the geopolitics of the post-COVID will be also shaped by how these global trade flows will be reshaped by this. Okay, so it's, it strikes me that we've really put our finger on a, a central challenge here, because on the one hand, there are some quite strong environmental slash sustainability arguments for onshoring. Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. for Absolutely. diminishing carbon footprints that may arise as a result of very far-flung transport intensive um, global supply chains. On the other hand, the history of development is often the history of comparative pricing and many countries have gone up the scale from low income to middle income through agriculture and through textiles in particular and then started building up more sophisticated manufacturing um, uh, capabilities. And if we interrupt that at this moment, I, uh, and then you add on climate change um, and, and uh, declining trade flows and, and increasing inequality, I agree with you that internal conflict, higher degrees of migration, um, stronger likelihoods of terrorism, which spill over borders, um, will, will, you know, be the foreseeable consequence. Um, so I guess one of the questions is, Simone, from where you sit, let's think, uh, let's troubleshoot this for a moment. Think of some of your producers, uh, particularly in Africa. And if it turned out that their production orders went down by a third, um, and let's, let's put aside the question that that may not be the case, that their comparative advantage is such that they will continue to be able to be competitive and, and then we will have to deal with all the sustainability questions in their own terms. But, but let's, let, let, let's just hypothesize that you're doing some planning for the worst scenario, uh, scenario work. Um, where would, what would they do? Where would they turn? Who would they sell their stuff to? So the first thing, this is some scenario that we've been evaluating in these days and we are working on it because this is what's what's going to happen we already see cancellation of orders our customers are not so bad so they kept some of the orders with us or we did a program to reschedule the orders towards the end of the year so we still have some 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 room but we are exactly considering what you said what happens and then the scenario that we are evaluating is we lose half not the third half of our uh, of our trade uh, so we, what we noticed is that first of all we are submerged by asian cheap imports will they continue or not 
because if the general reorientation is uh, to decrease a part of the international trade and, and to reshore some productions, maybe some part of these cheap imports will disappear. So a sort of unfair competition may, may disappear. I don't think it's the case. A good deal of these cheap imports will remain there because Africa has uh, developed a lot of very strong trade links and investment, most of all with China and with the rest of the world, uh, of Asia. And, and so this, this won't remain there. The second point is the growing middle class. Uh, the growing African middle class has a purchasing power and we already have customers who come to buy from us uh, for small shops, for individuals, for emerging local brands and distributors. But this uh, uh, middle class will be damaged by the post-coronavirus, for sure. Because the prices of raw materials, which is a big element of trade of Africa, uh, will go down. Because uh, cotton is not going down now, but, 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 but we do not know. There's a general slowdown. And whenever there is a general slowdown in the peripheries of the world, I use this, this uh, adjective, this, this name, peripheries, not adjective, this noun, in a, in, a, in a very neutral way. I'm not attaching any value to it. I'm just to, 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 to describe. It's a descriptive meaning I attach to it. Uh, in the peripheries of the world, the consequences will be even tougher. So this middle class will be surely damaged and her purchasing power will go down. So what we will need surely is to facilitate, to promote some forms of public and private investment in these economies to reboost these economies from within. That's why we are working with different businesses, such as uh, uh, telecommunications, such as uh, uh, other transformation of raw materials and so on, in order to create the premises for this investment. Uh, I, uh, to answer your question, I, uh, if we lose half of our sales, we'll be able probably to reorient a part of what we lose towards the local markets, but then we'll have to engage in promoting investment in these societies to invest more and more in creating local um, economic development and local capacities for better purchasing power in the middle classes. Then there is another element. Fashion has skills. These skills can be used for everything. Uh, uh, in things also not directly related to fashion. In this moment, we are producing masks and protective gear uh, for the coronavirus emergency. Uh, these masks are made with uh, uh, some materials that we import, sanitary materials like uh, anti an antivirus and uh, waterproof antibacterial, all this kind of stuff. But then they are also uh, uh, in, uh, in embedded in, in materials, cotton and so on that we have there. So we use the skills of fashion to produce things also that are needed in this emergency and in, beyond this, because this thing of the coronavirus will stay there for quite a long time. So we'll have to produce this protective gear, these masks, and all the rest for a while. That's another element of the answer. We are replacing some of the trade that we lose by producing these things and selling them to ordinary people and to governments, or to organizations, to NGOs, and so on. And then there is another element. We are trying to get integrated into a different value chain. Uh, we are producing things for interiors. Uh, the cutting and the stitching is also good for upholstery, cushions, uh, bedware, and all the other things. And that's what we are doing. We are also going towards that in order to increase the offer with the same skills of fashion and to, uh, to have more products for this growing middle class and, and top classes in terms of income capacity of the countries where we work. This will put us in a condition. Once all this passes away and there is a global reorientation of the world trade in the lifestyle sector, we may emerge stronger than before with a wider offer, with more capacities and with more investment in the places where we work. Public and private investment, more sector, more purchasing power. So also a stronger economy behind us if you want. But this is a long-term process. So we thought 
honestly. I've never declared this the first time I say this in, in public. We thought our business model was fine to keep on growing along these ways, as you said, along a, a tested development path every country has gone through, adopting the new technologies, adopting new materials, adopting uh, online trade and all the rest. But now we have been disrupted. It will require at least two years to resettle in this way and then to fight in a new way. I'm looking for uh, young people to join us because these are the people who will take over from us. This is a long-term perspective. So Simone, let me do a little, a, a little tactical pivot in, in, in the, the, the scope of a very broad you know, argument you've made, which, which I find myself sympathetic to and which I find a lot of fear in what you said, but also some hope in, in what you've sketched out. Um, you and I had a little bit of a conversation in another setting around the future of fashion shows yes. and um, these incredibly expensive, um, high carbon footprints, um, quite wasteful fashion weeks that occur in London and Milan and Paris and New York. Um, and you know the back of an envelope of what is spent in these endeavors and how they could be made digitally much much cheaper and more efficient with much lower carbon footprints um, but maybe there's a way to think of that uh, the money that was spent in those offset or put into a fund or allocated in some way to help with some of the transitions that you've indicated. Um, Absolutely, yes. Partners. But talk us through a little bit of that. Absolutely, yes. We, I am convinced that we can go digital in the case of many fashion weeks. And uh, the fact that the African continent and the places where we work are following the traditional fashion week system with a lot of people traveling, with a lot of physical presence and all the rest, is in this scenario completely wrong. We've got to go digital and these open possibilities also for us. The designers, the African designers that we mentor and that are our growing hope for the future because they will become our, our domestic market even if they grow internationally, these designers will benefit from a real digital African Fashion Week, which becomes a global one. And then digital fashion weeks will allow us also to embed uh, the creativity of the places where we work in the main fashion weeks, which is impossible today, given the physical presence. In Paris Fashion Week, if you put, people have tried to have a, a presence for the African fashion, but they are like zoos in the periphery of Paris during the main fashion week. Main fashion weeks happens in the center, and then there are these things and nobody goes there. In a digital setting, this is possible. This is possible, it's possible for, I, I'm, I'm working in these days with a very good designer in Iran, uh, for her to go to work in Afghanistan with us. Her visibility is impossible in a normal setting, but in this digital setting, this would become possible. And I think in this way, Fashion Weeks will become an engine of development for the whole of the center, also for the peripheries. That's an incredible uh, area of, of thinking. The second one, sorry, Paul, you stimulate my thinking. You know, it's always been like this in between us. The second one is uh, the standards that we want to, to follow for, for, ethical, for ethical fashion, for sustainable fashion. It's a mountain of standards. If you look at that, only on cotton, I have gods, I have this, I have that. We are trying to put together a guideline and a simple app for CEOs, decision makers to say, this is what is available, this is the way I take and that I, and that I transparently share with my consumers because consumers want clarity on that. And this even before, after this. And, and the main thing for us, along with all the environmental conditions that are key, it's living wage. Open costing to be sure that people are decently paid. Because in the world of today, we go to the moon. We have drones that are able to track down a jihadist in the middle of the mountains of Afghanistan. We are not able to pay a living wage and to ensure that we pay a living wage in all our supply chain. This is ridiculous. Today, there is the possibility of this. This will be 
This is linked to the thing I was saying before about societies, the impact of societies, regenerating the social capital of the places where we work. Living wage is a powerful tool, even for the COVID. Even for the COVID, in places where there is no uh, a public healthcare system, if people don't have a living wage, don't have enough money to pay for the healthcare that they need to face this, this emergency. And then there is the point of the, we spoke about this in another conversation, you are right, the point which is also linked to the fashion weeks and to all this about the seasons. We must arrive to a point in which fashion produces one season in a year. And as you rightly said in this conversation and with seasons embedded in this season, but one collection a year, one collection a year, this product development madness we were accustomed to is one of the reasons of the carbon footprint. If we reduce this, we reduce the carbon footprint, we, we get a more sustainable industry and we may enable people in our conditions in the places where we work to be part of the supply chain. And, and, and this is one of the roots of the problems. So yeah, I, I think the fashion week, the going digital there, the single uh, yearly collection and, and the clear focus on the sustainability standards are really, one of the elements of the future which will be accelerated and even more important now in the wake after uh, of this of this emergency so simone one of our um, one of our members um asked a, well, i think a thoughtful and a tricky question says i understand that there's a detrimental impact at present on workers and fashion brands but what about the benefits of for the environment water usage crops etc of long-term reduced consumption on everyone and I guess, you know, the question there becomes, again, we were speaking a little bit earlier. I just this morning did a podcast with the chief marketing officer of BPOP, you know, a 20 million person online community, 90% of whom are below 26, all of whom um, have fallen in love with the cleverly rebranded idea of secondhand clothes as vintage and all of them have become their own mini style and brand curators selling to each other, but creating this incredible circular economy where there's, where there's trade and commerce and trading happen, but not in new goods. And so I guess, and I say this with a lot of ambivalence as an African who desperately wants to see the global South rise as fast as possible, is there, a, is there space in the fashion industry to talk about uh, lower levels of consumption and how does that square with our development commitments? There is surely space and it's space, the higher you go in, in the quality of what you make, the better you comply with that. The enemy of this is, is the cheap fashion, the fast fashion and this kind, and this kind of stuff. Uh, so the higher you go also in material inputs and in the way in which you design the product for the product to be mended, to be repaired, to be recycled. I come from shoes originally many, many years ago and I remember the discussion in those days to have the completely recyclable shoes, a thing which, which looked like rocket science 15 or 20 years ago. Today you have that. You have brands, you have companies that do it, that use completely sustainable materials and that make that, that possible. Yes, we'll consume less. Yes, we will produce less, but maybe we will produce better. And, and we will engage our producers in the process of regenerating, recycling, mending, and all the rest. I see the future in production of agile units in which you have the production, but then in which you also have the artisans who can transform the goods at the end of their life cycle. Some of the bags that we make in, in Kenya, my dream is to see them coming back or, or going to an artisan in Europe to be transformed into something else. I remember the pioneeristic work years ago of, of Ilaria Venturini Fendi with Carmina Campus, who used to do that, no? And I, th I, st I think sh she still does it, but to a very a small extent. It's a very small brand. But she took existing things, not even existing materials, not even only, not only existing materials, but even existing products. I remember hats, glasses, and this and that, 
transforming them into, into new product to extend the life cycle of these products. So yes, we'll have a reduction surely in the linear consumption model of production, absolutely. We'll have more in the circular one, we'll produce less, but we'll engage the same people probably more in uh, regenerating, in remaking. It's a matter of design. Design is everything. Because if we don't design things in such a way that they can be done, they can be produced in this way, we are lost. And again, to have this kind of design, a single year collection. Because this is meaningful product development. It takes time, it takes thinking. Today we are accustomed to seeing designers, even in our small world, designers from the, the fashion industry who come to us and say, hey, can, can you develop this fabric in three days? And you tell them, listen, don't you know that we do manual weaving? Don't you know that manual weaving requires a, a three days only to prepare the loom? These people don't even know how things are made because they are accustomed to rushing so much that it's not important. There is some machine that will do it. This we will lose. We will get back to how things are made. We will also get back to some manual work along with the super technological work that you have in the world of today, where you have incredible materials, where you have incredible production capacities, 3D printing for souls, who makes, who now in your cupboard, all our, all, all our friends here in the audience, in our, in our uh, home, in our cupboard, how many shoes with leather soles do you have? 30 years ago, the 80% of shoes were like that. It's not like this anymore. Material innovation, the, the soles of your shoes have completely changed and they are recyclable, they are lighter, they are better for your feet, they are better for your posture, for your back, for everything. So the union of these two things, I'm an optimist on this. I see a world in which this will be managed. Of course, in, in the short, medium term, there will be disruption and losses of jobs for this. Absolutely. And this coronavirus thing will accelerate it. But in the long run, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be recovering in this way. We'll have to change our consumption patterns, of course. Yeah. But my mother who was a fashionist and who used to sell fabric, beautiful fabric in Italy, a life ago. But she used to make whole hair garments with a local tailor. Or she used to buy a beautiful thing from a brand in those very far days, one of the first brands, and to have it mended and recycled and remade many times. So Simone, a final question because we're out of time, but um, I wonder if there is a, is a, in this idea of pairing technology with development, one of the most interesting areas of, um, of innovation is around material science and molecular biology in particular. Where do you think new forms of crops, particularly crops that may be carbon sequestrating, that have better carbon footprints, might be imported into developing economies and used as base crops? Absolutely. We have an example of this in bamboo. Uh, bamboo is a crop that sequestrates a lot of CO2. It's formidable for this. It's an infestant because it grows, the roots travel in the soil and it grows everywhere. And it feeds a lot of animals. We, we approach the problem in the Virunga uh, National Park. You know, the Virunga is like the Amazonia of Africa and it spans across different countries. And the director of the Virunga is one of my heroes. I want to mention his name, Emmanuel de Merod. He's, he's a genius, a visionary and everything. And they discovered they have a lot of this bamboo that grows everywhere because also the gorillas eat, the famous gorillas of the Virunga eat uh, this bamboo. Now, bamboo, along with all these properties, feeding the animals, growing easily, and sequestrating a lot of CO2, can be transformed into a thread, into yarn, and into fabric, which has unbelievable properties, antibacteria elastic, water resistant. It has transparent. It's an incredible kind of fabric. That's an example. Research there on uh, how to uh, control a bit the growth of this crop and how to facilitate its transformation in a green way, in a green way without chemical uh, additions and all the rest is incredible. Just consider that in the Virunga uh, they have a lot of uh, energy produced through by water uh, hydra hydraulic energy because they have a lot of water in there. So they have a, a huge 
power station working on this. This first plant that transforms bamboo that we want to build together with the park will be totally based on green energy and green inputs. And that's an example. Another one is on silk. Uh, in many silk producing places, the varieties of silk, the old varieties of silk disappear, like in Afghanistan, because of war, because of this, because of that. The varieties of the region have to be introduced again. How do we check that these varieties are more resistant to, to pests and to this and to that? That's another area of, of research. We discovered that the mulberry trees where you grow the silkworm in the ancient times were used in Afghanistan to protect saffron cultivation uh, from dust and to protect homes from the wind because they grow fast and they are very reliable trees. Now we have set up cultivations of mulberry, saffron in the middle, so that we have two seasons of work for these farmers, the season of silk and the season of saffron. And saffron is very well paid crop. So even research and research on how to integrate different crops together and how to enable them to grow together and to be used in this perspective, which is the perspective of lifestyle I was saying before. We sell saffron because saffron is part of a lifestyle approach. So you have what you wear, you have what you, what you eat, you have what you put in your house. And at the same time, we use saffron, the, the, the waste of saffron processing as a dye, a natural dye for our silk. Simone, a masterclass in development economics and fashion uh, with material science and fashion week innovation and disruption top put on top of that together with ethical standards and consistency and we've got loads more questions but we're just out of time so we're going to have to have you back and i know that we're keen to work with you on some of your hackathons that you're doing and you are part of that <laughs> we, we will we will we will make some announcements on those sorts of things going Please. forward as well because we're very keen to both support your work globally but also to have you as part of a, a growing conduit community trying to kind of think about how fashion can be reimagined and I think you've you've really just scratched the surface today so my friend thank you for everything thank you for your work that you do thank you all the friends thank you the conduit a great conductive environment and uh, we will see you again. Stay safe and stay well, everybody. Bye-bye. Peace to everybody. Stay safe. Goodbye. Goodbye.